What's up, guys? Simon here. In this episode of the Ideal Hour, I have Jason Hunt here. He is an entrepreneur. He was previously in a Japanese rock band. He is specializing in marketing. He owns his own marketing company. We're going to talk about that as well. And uh, he has a podcast. The podcast is called The Merged Marketing Podcast. I love marketing. I actually have a marketing uh, company as well. So we're going to get to hear his perspective on the marketing industry, where it's going, as well as what it takes to be a successful marketer nowadays. Jason, welcome on the Ideal Hour. How are you today? Doing good, Simon. Thanks for uh, having me on your show. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you on. Um, when we first contacted you and it was my assistant, you know, she said you're in a, a Japanese rock band and or were in a Japanese rock band. I was like, what is going on here? Like, let's, let's crack the ice with that. Like, what is this uh, Japanese rock band talk that we have and, and what is this all about? Yeah, so uh, back in the day, I mean, right now in 2023, I'm a retired rock star, I guess you could say. It was years ago, um, back in uh, 2004, I moved to Japan. And okay. after living there for a couple of years, I formed a band with a couple of the, a couple of my roommates and a couple of students. I was teaching English at the time. And uh, so we called ourselves the, the KJs, which stood for Cracker Japs, if you're familiar with the uh, snack <laughs> Cracker Jacks. Um, and uh, so we basically were just playing in little dingy bars and stuff and ended up uh, doing a tour of Japan, which is pretty cool. We recorded a couple albums, but it was through that experience that I realized I was a much better marketer than I was a singer. And uh, okay. I was the front man of the band at the time. And it was uh, basically, it was through that experience, I realized I was, like I said, I was a way better marketer than I was singer. And I actually enjoyed marketing the music more than performing the music. So isn't that interesting and in how crazy like life throws a curveball at you? You're, you're doing something else. Your, your, your bandmates in this case expect you to really push it in. And, and, and push this effort to promote the brand. And then while doing that, you realize that you love the journey of the actual concept of getting attention to the band, uh, building a brand for the band. And then this leads to a career for you that kind of is in a different direction. Yeah, totally. This was in the days of like MySpace. I was using like SoundClick and this was Facebook was just emerging at the time. And, and what was a thrill for me was having a new set of ears listen to my music. And that was what I thought was really cool. And, and almost like, you know, promoting it, uh, you know, being a, 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 a jerk on stage, just running around uh, and, and trying to get more attention, whether we're playing at a festival or playing on the street and just trying to get people's attention. That's what, what really kind of drove me and motivated me to perform. Totally remember the MySpace days, okay? I was on MySpace. Uh, I was one of the people on MySpace with a song on there, and you could change the background. And funny enough, guys, I actually, uh, my wife and I communicated on MySpace, which is like over a decade ago. It's like 15 plus years ago, easy. When we tell people we kind of started communicating on MySpace, we didn't meet on MySpace. But people are like, what the hell is MySpace? And uh, Tom from MySpace. Our mutual he, friend. The, he, is he what? Our mutual friend. Oh, oh yeah, our mutual friend. In, yeah, yeah. Tom, our mutual friend, I think lives the life. He sold the company for like 800 million and he's into photography. He moved on from all the political BS that's captivated Facebook and Instagram and everything else. He's enjoying life. So MySpace was a hit. Uh, that's crazy. So you were, you've been doing marketing kind of from the ground up, really. It's, uh, it's, it's changed a lot since those days, you know, exponentially. Uh, let's get into a little bit more about that. Um, so you, you were doing the marketing for your band. You enjoyed it. How did your marketing company come out? And what is your marketing company called? Is it Merge Media? Yeah, so so when I left Japan back in 2008, I, I had to get a real job. So I came back to my home here in Canada <laughs> and uh, worked for a company called Cargill, which is the second biggest private company in the world. And I was just basically doing sales, selling meat to, to restaurants and, and grocery stores. And um, through that experience, it wasn't really for me selling meat. Um, I got a job in, in uh, selling traffic, online traffic. Mm -hmm. um, 
for a very small boutique agency in Toronto, um, basically selling traffic on websites, just brokering traffic, right? Yep. Getting publishers, selling the traffic to agencies. And, yep. um, and then through that is actually after that experience, I started my social media agency. And that was back in 2016 called Fresh Crowd. And at the time, you know, social media marketing was pretty cutting edge. You know, when you go into a knocking on a, a restaurant store window and talking to a manager and telling him about social media marketing, they would literally throw money at you because it was something new and cutting edge. Yeah, nobody knew about it, but people knew it was coming. This is before the SMM days of Ty Lopez. You know what I mean? It was before that. This is, this is like, uh, you know, it was a perfect timing to get into it. You know, I ended up selling roughly about probably 100 clients in between six to eight months. Okay. Oh, wow. and, and yeah. That's mind really you, good. they weren't paying a lot of money, but yeah, they yeah. were clients in the door. Um, and it's so residual, it right? At that time, yeah. it was residually. You're, you're booking them on a, um, a one-year contract, maybe a month to month, et cetera. And and oh. really just getting residual income. Stupid. It was stupid though. Yeah. It was just like, you know, charging like $199 a month for daily posting, which yeah. is insane. And yeah. it was uh, through that experience, I was actually doing everything in the business myself, you know, from the posting, from the business management, from, you know, billing clients to the content creation, to promoting the own business and running, doing periscopes and all this kind of stuff at the same time. And it was through that experience. I'm like, I need to hire someone. So yeah. I hired a, a guy by the name of Dave, who's still with us today. He's in the next room, actually. And oh, wow. uh, he's, been, he's been amazing. He's been instrumental in, in getting this business to where it is today. Um, you know, and, and so through that whole entire social media agency experience, uh, I came to the realization that we were losing out on opportunities because we were only a one trick pony. You know, we offered social media and that was it. And yeah. it was, you know, for me, it, it, it was, we were losing some accounts that we were doing great work for. And the accounts are telling us, they're like, Jay, we love what your agency does. You guys create awesome stuff. But this agency over here does this, this, and this. And I'm sick of talking to three or four different people at different agencies. Yeah. Light bulb went off and I'm like, okay, well, I got to merge my company with another one. And yeah. so um, there's a local company, SEO company, that's one of the best in Canada. I say that because if you Google SEO companies, they're right near the top. And wow. um and so I decided to merge with my business partner now, Todd Foster, and his mm -hmm. SEO agency, and uh, we formed Merged Media. So, um, and we acquired another social media agency last year. We acquired a web company a couple of years ago. So we're kind of that full service agency serving uh, our clients as sort of their outsourced CMO, I guess you could say. Which is very important. And, you know, and, and I don't know, you probably didn't do, you wouldn't know, but I also had a very similar company up about five years ago uh, called Ideal Visibility. And, and I was kind of doing the same thing. I was marketing all of these other companies that I've had. And I was doing a better job of monitoring that behavior or uh, what's needed and what's needed. And I said, screw it. Let, let, why don't I start my own? Like we were paying five grand to a company a month or three grand to a company a month. And then there's all these other components of it. You got your web developers, you got your PPC uh, or Google AdWords certified PPC specialist, and you have your SEO specialist, and you have uh, your content producers, and you name it and you name it. And I was like, I'm going to create my own. So I did. And we were doing really good. We, we uh, you know, we've had some contracts that were paying us quite a lot of money at that time. And then COVID hit. Uh, and COVID completely wiped the, out that small market of SEO, even though we did some consulting for some bigger companies, but it just completely wiped me out in that industry. And it wasn't my main focus. So I said, you know what, I can't tackle on all these projects that I'm actually doing and give a fair share to each of these clients of my time and so forth, because it's really, um, it's really important that when you take on a project, and you know, this probably better than most, that you give them that full attention to really grow their brand as well. And I felt at that point, just before you hired your number two, I was right at that cusp and I decided to just drop this project because it wasn't my main income and it wasn't something that would I felt would value my time at that time. Um, let me ask you a question. What I struggled in that business was a lot of our work was outsourced. Do you outsource or do you do it all in-house? That's, I think that's where a lot of agencies do it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Is they the outsource, they try to do the white label. Hey, look, mm -hmm. white label for a lot of other companies, right? Sure. But being closer to the source of the work getting done 
is, is super important. And this is why, you know, for our clients, the perfect ideal client for us is not a client that comes in for one service and it's just like one and done and they just want one thing from us. But when we are embedded in a business to help that business actually grow and we're doing the SEO, we're doing the Google ads, we're retargeting that traffic with social media traffic. You know what I mean? So it, it's having that all encompassing holistic marketing, uh, marketing, uh, well, I guess perspective, but you know, it's getting involved on that level with them is where we see the most success for our clients is when we're embedded in the business and they lean on us as an outsource CMO. Do we outsource? No. Um, we have a team internally here in our office of a dozen employees that are throughout Southern Ontario here in Canada. Mm -hmm. We meet at the office once a month, hit the whiteboard up, order in lunch and really get to connect. And then during the rest of the month, it's like, Hey, go, you know, what you need to do, go and do your thing. Now, it didn't know it wasn't always like that, you know, pre COVID, you were in the office four times a week. Sure. We into the realization people are a lot more productive when they're in their silos getting shit done. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, for, for us, that was a big that was a big thing for us. Now, we do have a, a team. Uh, mm -hmm. overseas that are not contract workers. They are full-time employees. We pay them very good salaries for sure. where they're based in the world. But these are like people that are coders. There are people that are certain designers and things like that, where you actually don't need to have language as your first language spoken. Yeah, people yeah. do not communicate with clients. They don't do any strategy. Strategy is done here in the office and with our team here in Canada. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm totally for having teams that do that, outsourcing to teams that are, not the face of the company, but they get stuff done and they're appreciative of their job. As, as you know, labor in, in the States, at least, especially in the Bay Area, we're here, we're, we're, I would say 20 minutes outside of Silicon Valley, 20 minutes from San Francisco airport. And we also built this big building for um, a lot of workforce. And then, and then COVID completely shifted that dynamic. There's no longer in person or that's not in demand, but I do outsource a lot. So I think, um, some of my best employees, some of my best salespeople are from uh, outsourced uh, different regions of the world. And that's totally okay, I think. One challenge that occurs sometimes when we talk mm -hmm. about certain outsourcing, like certain mm -hmm. tasks that, could, that, that can be outsourced versus uh, doing white label. You mm -hmm. know, when, when the, like we have an example um, of an agency that white labeled us mm -hmm. and yeah. their margins that they were charging their client were insane. Okay. So when we give a certain cost to that specific agency, um, you shouldn't be tripling the price yeah, really. because you're only going to get the value that you're paying for, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's the big struggle with some uh, some agencies that might outsource work is they're just putting on too much margin and the deliverable isn't matching what they're charging. Interesting. Right, so. Yeah. The base base kind of what I think Jason's referring to in this case, guys, is basically saying, hey, I'm dedicating so many hours, so much resources to what I'm billing you that when you uh, white label my product or my expertise, my skill set, my employees, et cetera, and white labeling, just for those that don't know, is it's basically you coming in as a company without letting the other company know that an, an external company is handling the, the workflow or the particular tasks that your client is demanding. So when you're white labeling to this other company uh, and they're charging three, four times more than what Jason or a company like his is billing you, then he's only allocating X amount of time within that budget, within that proposal, and the client may be expecting more. And Jason, feel free to add to that. That by saying like, look, yeah. that margin that you put on to that, to, to that an agency or a marketing firm may put onto that to charge their client, there could be value in there that like a creative direction, for example, is a great sure. example of the, the value that you're providing to that relationship. But if you're just hiring an outsourced agency to fulfill the work and essentially all you're doing is handing it off and sending a report, well, yeah. what's the value there, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think that's the key. As long as you can try to, try to pack in as much value as possible into that work that you're doing through creative direction, consulting, all this type of stuff, then it, then it could make sense to triple that cost, right? So basically uh, what Jason is mentioning is the company that's white labeling should also be doing more than just pass a pass-through company that's providing reports. They should really understand what's the next steps, the marketing goals, and so forth. And typically, I, from what I remember, white labeling 
really started when you weren't a specialist in that region, or maybe you were a specialist in social media marketing, but you weren't a specialist in SEO, but you didn't want to lose the client. So therefore, you would find a company like Jason's or, or another, and then you would say, hey, I really am developing this website for this client, or I'm managing their social media. I have no idea in handling their SEO. Can you help out? And typically, you would add on some percentages to that to keep the client happy. And so the client doesn't have to feel like they're leaving uh, your firm to find a firm that can encompass it all, right, Jason? There's really two ways of doing it, right? And and look, there's one service that we actually do. Uh, we don't even white label. We actually refer, right? There's either white label or there's referral. Referral, mm -hmm. you know, in a referral case, you know, you'll get a percentage of uh, whatever that client is sold for. Right. Mm -hmm. So for our, in our case, we give our referral partners 10 percent of whatever that client is paying on a monthly basis recurring. Right. So they're, they're just making money for yeah. simply making an introduction last year. For yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. White label, though, is when you know, you're choosing that price. You want to triple that price. Cool. You're billing the client. You're invoicing the client and you still have that relationship with the client. Um, so a lot of people, let's say you're a social media agency, you might want to white label, you know, SEO so it doesn't look like you're handing it off to another company and you're controlling that relationship. Yeah. Right. So you're right. still the first point of contact in the white label. And right. then in the referral program, you're you're expecting uh, uh you know merged media to really take over and you're collecting on the back end for the referral as long as long as the contract i would say is active or is there a term limit with your company yeah so as long as as long as that client is a paying uh a paying client to merged media that 10 percent kickback happens in the first week of every month excellent all right let's talk let's talk a little bit more um in regards to merged media right you're you're an entrepreneur obviously you you branded uh, your your own uh, band you said hey this is uh interesting i'm going to create my own marketing company uh what are some of the challenges of ha of having a marketing agency nowadays what are you seeing out there uh what would you say is one of the biggest concerns or challenges that you're facing I mean, back in 2016, 2017, it was one of the reasons why it was super easy to sell is there wasn't any, wasn't a whole lot of competition out there. Majority of the business I spoke to um, never dealt with another social media agency before. So it was very easy to sell. Nowadays, if you try to cold call somebody about social media, you're probably A, the 30th person that's called that day. Yeah. And B, they've probably already been burnt by two or three other agencies, right? Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. so that, that's the big, that's the big challenge now is trying to increase that trust factor with those leads and prospects. And there, and, and that's okay too, because there's so many ways we can do that nowadays. Right. So, so, you know, so give me a couple of ways you would do that for the audience listening. This is pretty good because I get about 10 emails. Hey, I'll handle your marketing and it's all from Gmail and spam and so forth a day. Uh, you know, Jason, go into that. How do you build that trust back up from someone that's been screwed by SEO, where an Indian company had taken over and sent a couple of reports here and there, but there's really no substance. There's no bite to what they've done for you. You know, it makes selling much more challenging now, doesn't it? When you've been burnt a few times before, right? It's like, well, what makes you any different? So, I mean, first and foremost, one of the best things to do is doing what we're doing right here now, Simon, is having a podcast, being yeah. on a podcast, people getting to know me, getting to know you. Um, you know, I have my own podcast for that reason. It's like, it, it's crazy how many new clients we get that it's only after they close that I realize they've been an active listener to our podcast for six months. They've been oh, wow. subscribed to our blog or email list. So they already knew me before I knew them, okay. right? Okay. One of those intangibles. You can never really put that pinpoint, that ROI on the podcast or the time invested in a podcast. But little do you know, these people are actually listening to you and getting to know you and know you, like you, and trust you, right? Yeah. So um, that is a big one. Also, we're continuously running top of funnel ads, showcasing clips of my podcast episodes to our ideal target audience, getting people watching a percentage of that video content, and then putting them into a certain audience, right? Mm -hmm. Now this is a retargeting audience where we mm -hmm. can send them testimonial ads, mm -hmm. case studies, all this type of great content, which further increases that known like and trust factor, wow. right? And this is something that a lot of these spammy, scammy agencies that just want your money are not doing because they're not investing in their own marketing budgets. 
They, they, they also are. don't have, I would say, the, a lot of these, say, Indian outsourced companies, there's so many, uh, they don't have the presentation down right. It's almost a quick, uh, it's almost a numbers game with them versus a proper presentation. But what Jason is saying here, guys, is Jason put himself out there to build trust, loyalty to a following far beyond uh, what normally is a general email or maybe a cold call. So he's really putting himself out there to get that potential client to say, hey, this is me. I'm here. This isn't a fly by night top type of operation. I'm not some Indian agency sitting in Bangladesh or somewhere you don't know about where you're planning on marketing. And we're here, we're a legitimate company. And that's what the podcast seems like has done for you, which is an extra step that you've taken, which you normally didn't have to take. Not many agencies are out there doing podcasts, I would say, out of the conglomerate of agencies. So it's a very smart move, Jason, and I'm proud that you did it. And I think it, it's from what you described, it's worked. Practicing what you preach, putting your money where your mouth is. You know, there's not a single service that we offer that we don't do for ourselves. Right. So, um, you know, whether it's our email newsletters, you know, whether it's nurture sequences for leads that come in through our ecosystem of lead magnets that we put out there, all this type of stuff that we sell to our clients, we do for ourselves to proof the yeah. concept, TikTok ads, Pinterest ads, LinkedIn ads, all this type of stuff, right? You have to do it that way. We can't just go and willy nilly try and test things with clients budgets, right? It's just so what does, uh, first of all, one question, even I'm interested, do you guys also offer services in the United States? I would imagine you have to expand to the United States. Yeah, hundred percent. We work with a, a good amount of uh, U.S. clients, right? I actually prefer, to be honest, uh, I prefer working with U.S. clients to Canadian okay. clients, right? They're really? Just, why, why yeah, is that, you know, that's a very good question, and we could probably do a whole nother podcast on that <laughs> question there. But I think a lot has to do. You know, Canadians typically are are more. If I were to just stereotype and generalize. Sure very micromanagers, right? They have to have okay. their hands in things. And where Americans are just like, I feel US clients have a tendency to trust you and your area of expertise, and yeah. they focus on their thing, right? It's they like, like to delegate, they like to make sure it gets done. It's very, it, I've, I've noticed that as well. It could have to do, it could have something to do with just the value of the dollar as well, where Canadians are a little more tighter with their budgets, uh, mm -hmm. where Americans are a little more like, Hey, I understand. They understand the concept a little more dollar in two dollars out and take that risk, you know, more, more risk involved. Right. So they, they, they're, they're willing to take that risk. Um, where for us, it's like, yeah, I mean, a lot of Canadian clients for the most part are, are they micromanage things much more than, than us clients, but I, I love working with us clients. We work clients over in Europe. We have clients down in the Caribbean. So, um, so we work with clients across the world. What, uh, what's a typical, let's say I'm a new business. Um, is that your typical client, Jason, or are you looking for a company that has five people? What's a typical budget? Give it, you know, I know. From my expertise, I know budgets are completely uh, different per company, but what is your target client and what is yeah. the entry level there? It's our sweet spot client who we do the best work for and uh, lead to being the happiest clients are the ones that are generating at least $50,000 a month in revenue, which is roughly six okay. k a year. And the reason why I say that is we mm -hmm. recommend any business should be dedicating six to 8% of their annual revenue towards their marketing budget. Okay. So when you do uh, the math, six to eight percent is what Jason is recommending from your uh, revenue, annual revenue, annual revenue into your marketing budget. So, um, so just under, if you're generating fifty thousand, just under five grand, around four grand. Uh, would probably go into your marketing spend. Yeah, three to four grand a month. And that's including everything. That's not just digital marketing. I'll say to clients, hey, look, if you do flyer ads, cool. You go to trade shows, cool. Factor that into that budget, but you should be spending around that three to 4K uh, amount per month, right? And, yeah. and so if you're doing that, you're in a good place and we're able to have a budget where we can actually bring the success, right? Um, just spending, you know, 10 to $30 a day on, on Facebook ads or Google ads, it just isn't going to cut it. Yeah. Um, there's probably too much on management fee to really make a dent. So that's kind of a, a really good sweet spot for us uh, and for our clients. What is a good, you know, if someone's trying to do this on their own or they're trying to hire a company like you, what is a good Facebook spend a day where you find to be effective? Um, obviously there's costs involved per click and so forth, but what are you seeing? 
Yeah, so it does really depend on on industry, you know, goals, objectives, you know, are you just doing it for brand awareness or you're trying to generate leads, um, you know, using Meta, Facebook, Instagram, one of the best ways to use those platforms is to use those platforms to get people off of those platforms and into email where you can start mm -hmm. a relationship with them and you own your email list. You know, your Facebook following can go bye bye tomorrow, but you'll always have that email list. And mm. you know, I like to look at it when we're doing any sort of meta marketing is it's almost like you're fishing. You're putting out a lead magnet, something that's enticing to that target audience, getting their contact information and then keeping that relationship going over email. And excellent. I think the big point here is if you're going to do any type of marketing. You want to extract some type of data. And this at this point is an email, a phone number or something along the lines where your secondary source, which is your sales team or your follow up marketing, including, um, you know, uh, retagging uh, residual marketing can can take over. That's very good point, uh, Jason. I, I appreciate you sharing those things. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what I would say our audience is a lot of entrepreneurs. It's a lot of people that are trying to better their position. I think marketing is one of the most important parts of any business. And something as funny as it is uh, for someone that's had a marketing agency, because my mind's always in different things. And um, um, my mother used to tell me I have like uh, needles in my butt. I can't sit still. So I create a podcast. I do all these things. But I, I've never focused on marketing so much in my businesses. And I think it's so essential to create this brand um, or create any brand for your business. What are some of the most important uh, avenues a user should take or a business owner should take? Is it on TikTok versus Instagram? Is it all around you have to be? So am I coming to you saying, hey, I, I need to, you have to be present on every single channel or should someone target, say, just Instagram or Facebook or does it depend on budget for you? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And and I actually addressed this question in uh, in the book that I published last year called Drop the Mic Marketing. Um, in, in that book, I talk about, you know, how to find your social media voice and the fact that I, I think being out on every platform can have its benefits because the users on different platforms are all different. For example, if you're if you have a if you have a product that you're looking to target a female audience from 50 to 60 years old, then you should be on Pinterest. If you're looking to target a B2B audience and you need to be on LinkedIn, um, I always say overarching Facebook and Instagram is a platform everyone should be on uh, because it's the biggest pool of people in the world. You're looking at 2.9 billion people have profiles on Facebook and Instagram. Right. So that's kind of like the, the low hanging fruit. You should definitely be there and apply your your effort there now. Okay. When it comes to really building a brand, you do have to personally devote certain time to a particular platform and there's only so many hours in a day, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's responding to DMs, doing maybe outreach outreach through DMs and things like that. Um, I personally like Instagram for that. That's just where a lot of my target audience is, is at. I actually enjoy that platform. Um, TikTok as well, which is a super addictive platform geared towards people with short attention spans. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's true. It, at least in America, it is. In China, it's a completely different perspective on TikTok from what I've read where they're solving math problems and they're getting highlighted, you know? Yeah, that's right. Right. Well, I mean, look, I mean, the algorithm's the algorithm, right? Yeah. What are all they care about the platforms is retention time, right? What keeps people on these platforms for longer? So, yeah, we could say, yeah, China is showing more uh, educational content to their user base where a lot of American content is geared towards like frat parties and pranks, right? Yeah, yeah like punching your dad or something like this. But maybe that's what people in each country are interested in, yeah. right? Well, they they're showing what they want. Right? Um, and, and, and I mean, I, I, it's TikTok's funny because you just get so, like I get addicted to it and you walk away from an experience on TikTok two, three hours later and it's like, what the hell did I just do with my time? <laughs> Why did I waste that time? Well, you're waiting for that next piece. You don't want to, it's like FOMO, right? You don't yeah. want to mix miss that next piece of content because it might be something that really captures your attention and could be life-changing. <laughs> In actuality, it never happens. You know, it's crazy. It's uh, social media has gotten into a spectrum of almost like addictive gambling to some. It's it's they can't get off that Instagram. I think, uh, uh, you know, you look at how much time is spent, say, on Instagram versus reading news or whatever it may be. It's it's quite exponential on some of these studies. And yes, it's addicting. Uh, I'm personally one of these people that sometimes catches myself and goes, wait a minute, I need to get off. I rather have stuff to do. Um, I mean, 
as a business owner though, you know, I, I do think there's huge benefits in dedicating a small ad spend to getting some paid reach on those social platforms, I whatever agree. social platform, right? Whatever it is. I mean, I personally prefer uh, Meta, Facebook and Instagram because it's the cheapest. You can spend $2 a day and, and reach a ton of people and let an evergreen ad just continue to run. Right. I agree. I agree. I think it's essential. I think you're going to capture the client on Instagram uh, often more times even than maybe on Google ads, uh, especially with the way they're using those platforms um, in, in terms of getting that data mining from them or their email or leads. Um, let's go into it. We, we talked about a little bit of digital strategies, which is basically, hey, get on Meta, get on Instagram, uh, look at TikTok. Um, you know, obviously discuss this with a marketing agency such as yourself um, uh, or a, an agency like yours. How do you measure a client's success in any digital campaign? I think that's a big one because a lot of times, you know, agencies will promise the world and you've seen it through your competitors and the delivery on the back end is not what the promise was. And I've seen it countless times, even with my own companies. Yeah. Yeah. This definitely uh, can be a challenging one at times to navigate because, you know, especially clients that are doing SEO, that's very easy to show, you know, the increase in traffic month over month or mm -hmm. quarter over quarter. Right. But mm -hmm. what you can't predict is a Google update, which also happens all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. There was just a, a, you know, recently there was a helpful content update by Google, which happened like this week. It just completed. And that, that, and anytime an update happens, websites shift up and down. And then as an SEO company, you need to figure out what you can attribute to that rise or that drop, right? And then make that an appropriate fix. So predictability on SEO is somewhat difficult, right? But the measure, the KPI is essentially traffic and also leads in a lot of cases or sales of product, right? And a lot of times what we'll look at, and this is what it, where it goes back to, you know, the best clients are the ones that are doing a lot with us because we can look under the hood if we have access to the website and be like, SEO is doing this. Your conversions are not increasing though. So that's a CRO issue, conversion rate optimization, meaning we have to go into the website and understand, well, what is not creating this uh, lead gen uh, as seamless as possible? Or what's the friction point, yeah. right? We need to address that friction point and make certain like, changes on the website. So, something along the lines, like, is your quote form completely not accessible when they land on your page and you're just not getting their data or whatever? And then taking it, taking it a step further, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say we've addressed it. Leads are coming in, people are filling out the form, people are calling via the uh, click the call button. Um, what's happening after that lead comes in? Because it's one thing for us to generate the traffic and generate the leads, but what's that sales process look like on the other end? So mm -hmm. this is a, you know, we work with a lot of dental practices, for example. Mm -hmm. And in that case there, we'll send a ton of leads and they'll be like, oh, our patient count only increased by 10. It's yeah. like, well, we sent you like a hundred leads. What happened? So yeah. we actually have a, a platform we use called call rail that we connect to all of our click to calls. And we can actually mm -hmm. listen in on those conversations and offer feedback to the receptionist that's taking those calls and be yeah. like, Hey, why don't you offer this or talk about yeah. the line or talk about this service? You know, we yeah. can really address it. So it's taking things. And this is where agencies probably are like a lot of agencies might be like, Oh, it's not our problem. We just delivered the traffic. Without yeah. actually asking the question to find out, well, what happened with that lead? Why did that lead die out when we did get it to you? Or why is your receptionist not answering that call with a smile? That's very important to, and, and an honest conversation to have with any business owners. There's been so many businesses I've walked into or dealt with or even um, um, been a part of where the, the first person answering the call has the shittiest attitude and and then you're wondering why uh, that lead or that sale has gone nowhere. Well, it's because the person that's the first in line, the first impression of your company is just the least pleasant on the other end. And that will kill any lead, in my opinion, that, that you get in there. And that's why restaurants oftentimes are used to have very attractive, appealing receptionists or presentable in most cases, especially in the past, where you want to be greeted well. You know, how many times have you guys gone to a, a restaurant and the person greeting you there cares zero Fs if you're going to be seated, et cetera. And you're like, what, why am I giving these people $200 or $100 to eat? That opens up a whole new conversation with a client, right? It's like, well, hey, you know, let's talk about 
the sales rep that's, that's taking that call, what, what's their commission structure like? Mm-hmm. What, how, are they actually incentivized to close that deal or are they just having scripted conversations with leads? <laughs> yeah, and getting their hourly and, and they right. think they're doing their job. So yeah, that's totally different. Let's, you know what, this will open something else. Let's stick to SEO because that's such a big thing. And we're going to talk about whether or not that's still relevant, still important in 2023 or the end of 2023. You mentioned there was a new Google update. They do these updates. What are uh, some of the most important factors in ranking SEO? And SEO, guys, is search engine optimization. Instead of paying Google ads to display your website on the top of the page or the bottom of the page or throughout, uh, you're organically ranking your website where Google says, hey, this is a credible source for that search term. We better put it up on, say, page one, which is where you want to be. Yeah, and, and one of the most important factors this year as we speak of this conversation around SEO is, is having educational and a highly authoritative content, right? So putting content um, on your blog that positions you as an expert more than your competitors, right? Showcasing, maybe even showcasing uh, people that work at the company and having thorough descriptions that are SEO optimized, positioning them as the authority. This type of stuff is what Google uh, put the most emphasis on with their most recent update, which is a helpful content update. Mm -hmm. So it's really about making sure that the the right content is being served at the top of that SERP and that the users are getting the best content with the most educational and highly authoritative content that's out there content generators out there, right? That's a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and even because right now it makes it very easy to create content. Like I'm sure I know chat GPT. Google chat GPT has been a game changer, right? Yeah. So everybody's creating chat GPT content. So what's the differentiating factor between one piece of chat GPT content and the next? Mm-hmm. It's all those other signals on the website that position that website as a highly authoritative website in that specific niche. I see. So you don't want to be kind of a, um, you, you, using chat GBT is efficient, but at the same time can really put you in a pool of the same thing over and over again. So you want to differentiate it a bit somehow by adding value that you feel like is from an, a strategy point of view. I mean, you definitely, you probably want to add a little more constant context to it than just copy and pasting a, a you know, a, an article from chat GBT. There's a lot more that goes into it. And, and I mean, up above and beyond the blog, it's, the service pages that, that you have written, you know, the, the, the about you page, all that type of stuff on your website needs to position you as that, uh, as that authority. And, you know, if you're, if you're a business out there, that's not doing any blogging at all, well, you're just going to fall behind. That's, that's it, right? You're, you're not, if you're not doing anything on your website to, to position you as the authority, authority, authoritarian in that industry, then you're going to fall behind. I ask you, Jason. So, um, Aside from maybe not doing SEO, which you kind of mentioned that, hey, if you're not doing blogging, you're not doing SEO, what are some of the biggest mistakes businesses make when entering SEO or even digital marketing? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake a lot of people make is is focusing too much on the closed sale and not deploying enough patience. Patience is so key to it, right? Because, you know, if you're the type of business owner or entrepreneur that just, you know, just uh, throws a bunch of shit at the wall to see what sticks, okay you need to deploy patience with that strategy on everything. Right. And, and not putting all your eggs in one basket. You know what I mean? We have a lot of clients that will start, let's try Facebook ads for a month. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, it didn't work. Let's go to Google ads. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's try Let's go. It's like, no, it's not the way to do it. You kind of got to deploy patience. Like with SEO, you're looking at least six months to a year to really start traction, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Right. Um, building that authority with, with Facebook or with Google takes time. Now, you know, even on, on Facebook and Instagram, we always say, you know, give it at least a few months. You don't need to wait as long as Google or with SEO, but you do mm-hmm. need to give it a few months because you need to set up your retargeting. You need to have those pools of people to retarget. You see mm-hmm. the most success in a meta campaign, the higher the ad frequency becomes. The ad frequency is how many times people see your ads, mm-hmm. right? The best campaigns are like you have an ad frequency of 15 to 20, meaning people have seen your ads 15 to 20 times. That's where we see the best results. Yeah. And and another question for you, how important, and I appreciate that, the, the tips that you got for SEO, it sounds like content is key. The proper strategy to go into it is is essential. It's a, it's a good strategy for your business long term, especially in that six to 12 months range, uh, combined with uh, social media strategies that... Uh, kind of make this a one uh, package. 
Um, I would say also to add, I think Jason, we miss would be to make sure your website is error free and yeah, we we talk a lot about the content there, but yeah, making sure the website obviously does not have errors. Your H ones meta tags are are filled. Make sure your G Google business profile is full and posting to it on a consistent basis. That's your formerly GMB. Mm -hmm. um, Google My Business, now Google yep. Business Profile, is it, it's essentially, uh, I don't want to say it's a social media uh, tool, but you can post to it on a regular basis because what that does, it gives signals to Google that you're an active business, yeah. right? So making sure that Google Business Profile is up to date, especially for local businesses, will help you rank in the map pack. That's okay, so which awesome. is a little map that shows local businesses. You want to be shown up there, especially for any local business. And let me ask you, uh, your firm, um, you know, Merge Media, they do both, I would imagine, local SEO, which is kind of more of a Google Map uh, centric uh, focus or somewhere local focus with local keywords such as cities and towns. And uh, I would imagine you guys also do national SEO or uh, SEO targeted, say, in the United States, where someone is more broad keyword um, uh, searching. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, to it's a different strategy, obviously for local SEO, you're focused on citations, which is other little directories and websites that are, that can drive another link back to your website. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a local landscape business that we've been working with for years. Um, and we help grow their business from 200,000 in revenue a year to 1.3. And a oh, lot wow. of that, yeah, 1.3 mil. A lot of that is by ensuring that their business shows up in the map pack three times, anytime somebody Googles lawn care or snow removal, That's right? So cool. Which is pretty cool. They get all yep. those calls. Anytime the first snow snowfall we get here next month, likely they're going to get like 70 or 80 calls. Let me ask you, Jason, another question to follow up to that one. How many links is a good amount of links to buy? Or is that based on how competitive uh, or is link building even a thing anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, obviously, backlinks is, is super important, but it really depends on what your competition is doing. So, anytime we start a start a program, we we audit and, and the the top five competitors within that niche, right? We need to see what backlinks are driving traffic to their websites. We want to go out there and try to get the same links if we can, and find all those signals that's helping drive their ranking to number one on Google, right? And then try to replicate it. So it really does depend. Uh, there's no fixed number on how many you need to get. It really is a, a case by case basis. And one of the reasons why this is an ongoing program, because we want to constantly compete with the competition and seeing what they're, what, what links they're going after. We want to go after the same ones, right? Excellent. And uh, let's get into a little bit about where you see the future of digital media going. Where um, we know now it's like super important for a business to happen, to have it, excuse me. But where do you see this going? Where do you see the trend of digital media? And you could add on to that, particularly podcasts, YouTube, yeah. social media, whatever you want. Where do you see this going? I, th I think the big thing is, is, is carving through noise, right? Yeah. Because everything that we're talking about here is very noisy. Like you spend more time scrolling past content than anything else, right? I forget the number of, as to how many feet of how many feet you, of content you scroll past on a daily basis, but it's insane. Like two football fields or something like that, right? Yeah. Like it's crazy, but all you're trying to do, whether it's on your social media feeds in your inbox, yeah. All you're trying to get to is the things that matter most. Mm -hmm. One thing that's inevitably going to happen is chatbots, uh, AI conversations with people. But what people are really going to long for in the long run are those one-to-one -one connections with people. You know what I mean? You can't take that away, whether it's, you know, an actual video that you're sending through email to a person, uh, communicating with them, going to networking events and trade shows, shaking hands. I think people are always going to want that. They're always going to long for that. And and AI can't shake a hand. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's one of the things. But I think that's like like with anything, people are going to become numb to certain things. This the AI chatbots are going to be effective for a certain period of time. But what's that next level of of? personability is that even a word personability but ability to to relate to somebody on a, on a personal basis and have that kind of a handshake and head nod and get to connect we're gonna need to we're gonna need to look up if personability is a word and i might be but but uh i understood what you meant and i completely agree i think uh it, it kind of goes back to that chat gbt thing you mentioned which is like hey you could have a robot spit out an article but is that article going to differentiate you from the next person that had the same robot spit out an article, right? 
So like two websites having pretty much the identical content, which is also bad for say SEO and so forth, is not beneficial towards anybody. It doesn't give you that character, that oomph, that differentiation, what makes you unique and qualities to your website. And I think agencies that are successful, including yours, it sounds like uh, it adds that oomph or that value to that client's content. Um, Let's also talk about uh, PPC or Google AdWords. We haven't really brought it up as much, um, maybe for some retargeting we did. Uh, but uh, how, you know, when, when I was uh, running my bigger business, uh, Google AdWords was a big thing for us because it, it happened to be in the airline industry and we were really trying to target clients that would fill out a quote form for a flight booking and so forth. How, how big is Google AdWords? Do you see this? as a growing trend or is this um, a too expensive of a marketing trend? Because you're really competing with not only giants in the industry, but big budgets. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, the market is the market, right? If there's yeah. people out there who are gonna pay it, then they can charge whatever they want for those clicks. I think uh, depending on the level of intent of a person's, uh, you know, ideal audience, right? So, you know, if you're a dental practice, all of our dental clients are, are crushing it on, on Google because I mean, they want dental practice in my area or yeah, dental yeah. practice near me, you know, all those type of searches um, they want to be found for and they and dental practices because they make pretty big margins on their patients will pay say $5 a click. They do. Yeah. They'll do an operation and they'll make a couple thousand dollars on, and then they're happy for, for that client. So very good point actually for the audience. Um, if you're in a specific niche area, such as a dental business, maybe some printer supplies or something that's local cleaning service, like commercial cleaning companies, I could imagine those are very essential Google AdWords uh, campaigns. If you're in a more broad industry, maybe the airline industry or maybe transportation that's competing with uh, conglomerates like United or Cruises or whatever, then you're competing against some big budgets where you may not be able to outbid them or your cost per click to obtain that client may be very high. Um, but it's all, it's it's something it sounds like, Jason, you still should investigate or really dive into and see if it's worth it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say, yeah, a hundred percent, you know, you're capturing that high intent traffic that has the pain point that you address and they're looking for your service. So absolutely. But I think you're missing a huge opportunity if you don't have a pixel on your website, a meta pixel to retarget that traffic on mm -hmm. Facebook and Instagram after they spent time on your website. Right. That's yeah. a great opportunity. Let's say you're um, any business that, that would like high intent traffic, like for a collision center. Well, if yeah. somebody's Googling collision center in my area and they're surfing around at different collision centers and then immediately they hop into Instagram and they see a testimonial for your collision center. It's a great opportunity to get them back to your website, right? We've covered quite a bit of topics of how important, important social media is not only to the clients or people that are building a brand, but even to yourself to get more clients to build that trust for them to hire you to do what you're doing on just to get them in the door. And that's pretty creative. Um, I totally respect it. Um, I do have a few questions now that we're going to shift to um, as we wrap up here as we're going to shift to management. Now you've ran a successful company. It sounds like you've have, you mentioned over 12 employees. Uh, you've mentioned a team that's remote as well. Let's talk a little bit about management. How do you motivate your staff to make sure that they are taking each project with the way you would want them to, to carry it on and continue to provide that level of service? Some of them being remote, some of them coming in for meetings, et cetera. Great question, because this has changed so much over the years. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I think it's safe to say, you know, we're finally in a position with our agency where we've got the best team we've ever had. Yeah. Um, and they they are they and, and, you know, they're just motivated to actually do a good job and they take pride in their clients. And I think a lot of that stems from actually having relationships with your clients. So when you're embedded with clients and having regular calls with them on an ongoing basis, like you have to hold yourself accountable. You don't have to, you don't want to show up to that, you know, weekly meeting or monthly meeting, you know, being unprepared or yeah. not performing. So essentially it's, it's, it's those calls that essentially keep you accountable and keep you working hard. You don't need to offer, you know, bonuses necessarily or incentives. The incentive yeah. is just is to do good work. And a lot of that stems from creating that culture internally. And it took us years to do that, you know? 
So accountability is a big word that you threw out there is really you're not incentivizing them with necessarily money, but you're you're expecting a level of performance from them is what it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think we we take good care of our employees. You know, they have really they have really good jobs where they have autonomy to do their jobs to their ability. They have flexible hours to get things done when they want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our retention rate with employees is very high. Um, okay. You know, and I think a lot of that uh, allows them to go and just do their job what they're hired to do without the pressure of having a micromanager over their shoulders ensuring they get it done. Mm -hmm. um, we find employees that we've had in the past where we've had to micromanage just never work. You know, it's, it's never happy. Just, not happy for they, us, not happy for them. It doesn't work. They just didn't have it, and you felt like you're frustrated trying to get them to get it, and it just yeah. wasn't in their blood, so to speak. Even even our team overseas, like mm -hmm. these are people that have been with us for years, right? Like mm -hmm. we, and that's one thing. If you've ever hired VAs before or somebody yeah. overseas, you know it's really tough to find a good one. Absolutely. And when you find a good one, you take care of them. Right. Yep. So, yep. You know, we pay ours very well. And like I said, they're full time employees and, and they have the autonomy to do the job as they wish, as long as they're doing a good job and providing good results for our clients. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, hiring uh, overseas is often a tale of you thinking you're getting a good deal because it's so much cheaper. You're avoiding the unemployment taxes and all the headaches that come along with hiring people domestically. Um, the lawsuits potentially and all these things are saving money. But, you know, if you don't hire that right person, you're just really wasting your time, in my opinion. And it's happened quite a few times here. Um, let me ask you a second follow up question. How do you manage an employee that's just underperforming? What's your go to approach for an underperforming employee? And, yeah, uh, so I, I think the key is is. It's funny. There's a few ways, a couple ways we went about this over the years. Um, one, you know, if you find there's some red flags there, uh, the good chance they're not going to go away. Uh, and you just kind of cut your losses when you can. Uh, okay. We've done that before, right? It's like not waiting around, just make the decision quick and, and get it done with if you don't see it working long term. A lot of times you'll give them chances and try to make it work. But, um, you know, a lot of times, though, you know, for those, those employees that have been with us longer and you start seeing a decrease in performance. Um, you really need to turn it back on yourself as an owner in the business and understand, have I put this person in the best position possible to succeed, mm -hmm. right? Have the, do they have all the tools they need to succeed? Is there something that they need to perform their job better? It's having those open door conversations with employees to understand what they really need, right, to help them perform. And, you know, in some cases, we realize that certain employees maybe weren't in, in the best position possible. Maybe their skill set is better served in a different department. So sure. we've done that before too, because you know loyalty can be hard to find too. So when you have somebody that's loyal, maybe you maybe there's a better position at the company for them that serves mm -hmm. their skill set better. I agree. Yeah, you moved them. You 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 didn't want to give up on them, but you realize they're say not a salesperson, you know, <laughs> and but they're great at communicating. So you put them on the receptionist. Uh, front line or something like this. We moved a, there was one uh, girl that was an employee with us and she came in as a graphic designer and um, she didn't last very long. So like I said, a second ago, we let her go relatively quickly. And after we let her go, I said to Todd, I said, Todd, let me see her resume. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and she went to school for film studies and videography and this and that. I'm like, wait a second here. We hired her for the wrong job. She's yeah, a really, yeah. nice, really nice girl. And we ended up hiring her back as a videographer for a company. And she traveled with me to shows uh, that I spoke at in Tel Aviv and Las oh, Vegas. Wow. And she just followed me around with the camera all the time. We did that for a whole year. And, uh, and that was a really good position for her because she was really good at that. That's cool. And she probably knows uh, uh, a little bit more about your rock band days that we've heard uh, with, based on the amount of time she spent with you. Uh, quick question in regards to now your book. You mentioned you had a book, Drop the Mic Marketing. Uh, give us a little bit about why that book's important. And uh, let's get into the podcast. A couple questions there and wrap up the interview. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the, Drop the Mic uh, Marketing was written with a, uh, a it was co-written with a guy named Mike Almer, who's a pretty popular writer for the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team oh, here in okay. Canada, and, and he wrote for the National Post. And and he ended up uh, writing that book with me, which was an amazing experience. He basically sat me down with about four two-hour sessions, learned everything about my life, and then he came up with the idea for the story. Mm -hmm. And it was really about, um, you know, 
uh, every single entrepreneur is essentially a rock star in their own industry. And then they, they, they need to leverage social media to get the word out there about their story, their journey, and their known like and trustability in their industry. Right. That's so, cool. so that's kind of the, 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 the gist of the book. You can check it out on Amazon, drop the like marketing. And the, I assume the book gives you some tips, some uh, feedback on how to um, improve your marketing strategies and so forth, correct? So if someone's kind of trying to dive into marketing, this is a good read? Yeah, so definitely. On Drop the Mic Marketing, we get into you know specifics around how you can start using Facebook, Instagram advertising to promote yourself and your business. And we talk about some of the tactics that have worked for growing our own personal brands here at Merged Media, as well as our company. And over the years, through successful campaigns we've run, we just kind of show some of the examples. Excellent. Maple Leafs, that's pretty cool. Um, let's ask about the podcast. The podcast is called uh, Merged Marketing, the Merged Marketing Podcast. Uh, tell me a little bit about it. How how fun has it been to have your own podcast uh, to not only discuss marketing? I, I, I haven't checked it out, I'm being honest, uh, but I, I will. And I want to know, what is it like running a podcast? How do you mix in all this time from managing all these campaigns, employees, and so forth, and still having a podcast. Yeah, as a podcast. So the podcast, basically, you know, I just need to show up because I have a team behind me that does all the production, all the editing, all that sort of stuff. We're creeping up to, ep well, we're all, we're ep at episode 200. So oh, wow. okay. we've been consistent ever since February, 2020, right? Good so for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Once you get to about, you know, 30, 40 episodes of the podcast, you no longer need to search for people because PR agencies reach out to you, giving yeah. you all sorts of guests. Like we had the VP at Pepsi. We had, oh, yeah. uh, you know, we had, you know, we've some pretty known, well-known marketers, Dennis, you has been okay. on a podcast, Evan Carmichael. So we've had some pretty awesome guests over the years. Um, and it, it's been a blast. I sh like I said, but I batch everything, right? All my podcast content is done same day of the week. Uh, every, every, every month it's done same day. We, every Wednesday is like podcast day for me. So right. it's like, and Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, or sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I can get everything else done. I need to get done. That is so cool. It sounds like, uh, well, first of all, 200 plus episodes. That's incredible. You're the second podcast guy that, um, or company or individual that's told me 30 podcasts is like that threshold. I've done over 300 YouTube videos, so I know the consistency involved. Um, you know, I personally like doing podcasts more and hearing individuals like yourself give a, a little bit more uh, of substance because you add such a perspective. Uh, but that's pretty neat. Uh, I'm excited for that. And uh, personal life, uh, how do you have kids? Do you have uh, you, you're married? So. How do you manage all of this and kind of manage the podcast? I know you've said that you have people editing, but how do you manage all this? What advice would you give to someone? Yeah, I got th I have three kids, two daughters and a son, and they're between the ages of like three and eight. So, oh. um, so it's busy, but I think the biggest uh, way to balance that is disconnecting. Like my phone is not near me when I'm not working. You know what I mean? It's just like the phone, the phone's never near my bed. It's just, I, I just keep it away from me and I just, and I'm 100% there with my kids, right? Because if, if you even getting notifications on your phone while you're trying to play a game of snakes and ladders, it's just like, you might be in the game of snakes and ladders, but you're not really in the game of snakes and ladders because you're thinking about something else, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's by managing that and just really separating the two. And it took time to figure that one out, yeah. but uh, it's just I'm so much more happier for it, right? Because I don't mm -hmm. want to have any any time not spent with my kids where I'm regretting it, right? So guys, we've heard uh, Jason Hunt here give us a lot of feedback on digital marketing. We've uh, discussed the importance of putting yourself out there as an entrepreneur, as an uh, as a owner of a company, really building trust with the person that runs the business. We talked about leaving your cell phone behind when you're spending time with the family to reset because uh, as Jason is busy, over 200 episodes on his podcast, he wrote a book, he's managing clients. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts. And the, the takeaway I get from this interview, and there's quite a few, is really focus on your marketing, create a strategy, uh, sign up or have a company that you trust represent you. I think that's going to take you to the next level. Don't always, the cheapest solution may not be the best solution. 
Um, and that goes for hiring not only employees, but also virtual assistants remotely. Uh, overall, Jason, this has been a, a very great podcast. I've learned quite a few things with the new trends. Um, I'm excited for you. I truly appreciate you coming on uh, the Ideal Hour and giving us some feedback. I hope it gets you uh, some some potential clients going forward. And I'm sure you'll uh, we'll link your info in our podcast here, your company, your podcast, and feel free to come back on the show. Maybe one day I'll jump on and give you my life experiences on uh, you know your podcast and and share some of the things that I've learned. Uh, but I truly appreciate your time. Thank you, Jason, for coming on. Simon, no, thank you for the opportunity. And maybe someday we'll be able to do this in person. That would be awesome. You're always welcome to this side to, uh, you know, you, you and your wife, you ever want to visit Napa Valley, uh, you have a friend in the Bay Area. Um, you know, I'm, we're nearby and, and surprisingly, people take me up on these offers. So uh, I like to meet very interesting individuals such as yourself to, to better myself and to better the viewers and their opportunities in life, especially in running business, because it's so challenging. So, um, you know, that's the beauty of YouTube and that's the beauty of podcasting. And you know that all well, because you do that extra step to get out there. Jason, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate your time and uh, we'll definitely keep in contact. Mm -hmm.